So John John Melko of Foley was going to moderate a panel on the oil industry uh, called Volatility in the Oil Patch. Where did all the value go? Uh, so, uh, John, it's all yours. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. Can you or good afternoon? Can you hear my uh, audio? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us. As uh, as mentioned, we're going to talk about volatility in the oil patch and the destruction of value that we've seen, particularly in the last year. We've got a great panel for you assembled today. We've got some material which I'll broadcast on your screens in a second, and I believe that uh, I believe that the uh, the Beard Group will make that material available to you. Uh, I'm going to start with an introduction of our panelists. We have a very strong panel today. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they're going to be speaking. So first will be Chris Marcus. Chris is a partner in the restructuring group of Kirkland and Ellis. He is uh, a tremendous lawyer, uh, known mainly to me, at least on the debtor side. He is highly rated by both national and international rating agencies, legal rating agencies, and was named previously as a the young a, a restructuring lawyer of the year. And uh, he is still young, but uh, and is still rated in the top restructuring lawyers in the U.S. The second speaker you'll hear from is Michael O'Hara. I met Michael when he was at PJT. We worked together in a very large case. Michael is now at Jeffries. And he is co-head of the U.S. Restructuring Group and serves as the managing director. Uh, Michael is a is a uh, uh, went to Georgetown for undergraduate, has an MBA from Columbia, uh, and we'll be hearing from him. And he has some terrific uh, slides and industry information to share. Uh, the last panelist that will be chiming in, it, just in order of our presentation today, is Robert Stark. And Robert, for those of you who spend uh, any time in the restructuring world, is known primarily as a as a committee and and bondholder, unsecured bondholder lawyer. But like most of us who are bankruptcy lawyers, uh, Rob, Rob has served uh, as represented virtually every interest that could possibly appear in a case. Uh, that leaves me. I am. My name is John Melko. I am the co chair of. Foley and Lardner's National Restructuring Group. I'm cited in the firm's Houston office. Uh, like Rob and our other panelists, I, I, I have been, Chris, I've worked in everything from retail to telecom to shipping to oil and gas. Uh, as you might imagine, particularly being in Houston, my diet has been uh, not exclusively, but heavily oil and gas almost all the time uh, for the last number of years. Uh, what, so I'm going to share, I'm going to put some slides up on the screen just so we can get a view of uh, where we are in the, uh, uh, I need to share the screen, just, just how the industry is doing and what we've seen over the last year. So bear with me and I want to pull up. Okay, so uh, can you see the PowerPoint? Can anyone respond? Not yet. Okay. You can see your jeans, though. You see what? You see your jeans, though. Oh, perfect, yeah. <laughs> I had to move my computer around. Rob wanted your, me to wear your oil and gas themed tie. Uh, yeah. Rob wanted me to wear a Stetson today, but uh, uh, yeah. I settled for the tie. There we go. Uh, Megan, if you're on, that should be broadcasting. Let's, on. Let's, let's try this. Still no slides, huh? Coming out of those. You won't be surprised to know this worked perfectly in our practice session. All 
All right, let's go ahead and I'll continue fooling with this, but let me, let's just walk through some of this material. Uh, so where are we in terms of, of production? Uh, last year, now let's talk about last year for just a moment. The domestic rig count uh, here in the U.S. was 802 rigs almost exactly one year ago today. Uh, Canadian rigs, there were uh, 125 running, and internationally, there were about 1,100. Today, uh, we are at 320 rigs in the U.S., 656 internationally and just 102 rigs turning to the right in Canada. If we look at prices uh, and production a year ago today, we had roughly uh, just under 12 million, uh, 12 million barrels of crude oil per day. And in, uh, in the end of month in October, the price was $53 and 18 cents. We were producing 3.3 trillion cubic feet of gas a month. And the price was 224 per MCF. Right now, uh, we are still producing over 10 million barrels a day. So production has come up from where it was when it crashed. Uh, and prices, and we are still over uh, 7 billion cubic feet per day, uh, but well off of last year's totals. This morning, uh, crude oil prices for WTI were 4474 47 so it's down $14 from last year, or not 10, just under $10 from last year. Brent crude, the international benchmark, 47.55 today, which shows you Europe's doing worse than we are. And natural gas is at 287. So that trended up nicely from last year at this time. If we look at the Energy Information Agency, they're telling us that uh, they're tracking the prices for the, the contracts. And that, that just those are the prices I just gave you. Uh, Wells Fargo Commodity Reports currently uh, forecast a crude oil for the balance of this year at about 45 bucks. And that basically remains flat for the next two years, at least according to Wells Fargo. Now, I will also tell you that same report a year ago was forecasting uh, crude oil in the 50s for this year, and we haven't we haven't seen that all year. Uh, of course, we had the Saudi Russian price war, and then the uh, uh, and then the COVID nineteen virus, and natural gas similarly is supposed to actually trend down a little bit in the following two years. Uh, our friends at Haynes and Boone do a oil and gas bankruptcy tracker. And so far, calendar year 20, there is just under $54 billion in debt of Chapter 11 debtors uh, in the oil and gas sector. Uh, let's jump in with our panel. We're going to start on a hypothetical. And our hypothetical company is in the oil business. It's called Wall Street EMP Inc. The balance sheet as of the end of the month, uh, in November, showed cash and cash equivalents of roughly $20 million, oil and gas reserves of and equipment of $2.5 billion. And of course, because the you've got to get from Teterboro to Houston quickly, the company has a G5, which is currently on the books for five million bucks. Now, total assets at two billion five and a quarter. On the right-hand side of the balance sheet, it's it has an RBL revolving uh, uh, reserve-based loan that is that is pegged to the uh, price and the quantity of oil of seven hundred and fifty million dollars. It has unsecured bonds of one point two five billion. It has trade debt of about 45, but as, we, as we'll as we see, that's probably not the whole picture for trade debt. So that gives a total debt of $2 billion, $45 million, showing equity of, of uh, $480 million, and that balances out our balance sheet. Now, a couple of footnotes. On the liquidity side, the cash on the company's 
not cash flow positive, and it has about six months cash on hand. The the banks uh, who the bank who heads up the uh, uh, the RBL facility is going to do its year end uh, reserve reevaluation. And that is expected that redetermination, as it's called, is expected to uh, require the company because the reserve views are expected to be lower to reduce its line of credit uh, for in an amount of cash, which the company does not have. The company is also burdened by long term midstream transportation and processing agreements. And what that means is that the. the the small grid of pipelines that are built built out to go from the oil and gas wells into collection points for, for gas. It'll be uh, for oil. It'll be tanks and, and trucking racks and for, or perhaps a pipeline and for natural gas. It, it always goes into a pipeline. The, those builders uh, build out those, those gathering systems as they're called, and in return, they want to know that they're going to be able to uh, recoup their investment and make some money. So they get something called a covenant running with the land that essentially says, thou shalt not ship oil or gas uh, except through this grid system that we have built for you. And that's a very hot topic in bankruptcy cases today. And because they file those agreements in the real property record, uh, some courts have held them to be covenants running with the land, almost like an easement that you cannot get rid of in a bankruptcy. Now, that that debtor, uh, of course, it will be a debtor, comes wandering into Chris Marcus's office. Chris, the either a, a special director or maybe the CFO, contacts you with this fact pattern. What's your first concern here? Where do you go and what questions do you ask? Um, well, I, I think uh, my first uh, uh, my first set of concerns are um, around you know uh, timeline. Really, um, I think when we get involved in cases, uh, kind of understanding the issues uh, that are um, burdening the company, and um, you know, kind of how to you start thinking about how to fix those. Those are some of the first things that we. Um, that we start thinking about. I, I, I lost the slides, but I'm going to, I think I'll, I'll do this from, uh, from uh, memory. I mean, my, my biggest first concern is the company's liquidity. Um, you know, this, this first slide suggested um, uh, six months of liquidity, uh, which is, you know, may or may not be um, a lot of time to help fix um, whatever the uh, whatever the uh, overall uh, problems are with the company. But I mean, the, the RBL line is fully drawn. We're expecting a redetermination within a month that is going to bring the borrowing base down. Um, and and I mean, twenty million dollars in cash and cash equivalents in a balance sheet like this, and a company that's about to get redetermined um, has a bond coupon payment in a month. Um, you know, without no, over market midstream contracts, without knowing more, doesn't really seem like cash that is sufficient to allow this company a six month runway toward any type of. Um, uh, you know, amendment or restructuring discussions with creditors. And so I think my first, um, my first thoughts, my first questions for the CFO are, are really going to be around um, liquidity and, and what other issues we're going to have to address on, and, and on, and what's the timetable to really address those issues. So you mentioned a bond coupon coming up. Do, do you advise the company to make that payment? Well, I mean, uh, it, at, at, in the first conversation with the CEO, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise either way. But um, you know, there are a lot let's of considerations. Assume the, let's assume yeah. they got the retainer. Uh, say that. Ask, say that again, John. I didn't hear you. I said, let's assume that you got the retainer. Let's assume I got the retainer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, it, it's it's those are um, you know those are bespoke uh, issues um, in a situation like this. I, I can't imagine what the benefit to the company would be of paying that that bond coupon. 
Um, and I got to believe that as you're leading up to an RBL redetermination, our RBL lenders are going to be pretty vocal about, I'm just going to assume from the fact pattern here that our RBL lenders are senior secured in the bonds, whether or not they're, oh, they're unsecured. Okay. So bonds are, um, you know, they're subordinated to the RBL. I, I got to believe the RBL lenders are going to be vocal too about allowing um, a sufficient coupon payment, a significant coupon payment to go uh, out to junior creditors at a time when the company you know, looks to be pretty strapped with cash. So my guess here is after we do the work and we, you know, and we discuss, you know, the pros and the cons is going to be, um, you know, don't make the bond payment. Um, and, and then we're going to be on the clock. Michael, let's say that you uh, are hired by an ad hoc group of, of these unsecured bondholders. I don't think that anything Chris said is going to warm the cockles of your heart. No, no, but it's also not going to be a surprise. And unfortunately, we're seeing it uh, more and more in these recent cases where the banks are being pretty um, firm as to their need to uh, protect themselves. Uh, we've now seen over the last couple of years several instances where the value of collateral has evaporated very quickly. Um, you know, a case I worked on, uh, Southland was a good example of that. Um, and banks know that, and therefore they're going to be much more proactive about reducing borrowing bases and not having that type of situation. I think Chris is spot on. They're, they're going to look at that unsecured. Uh, interest payment that's coming due and say, don't make that. Uh, and so that starts your clock. And I, I think Chris is also right about the other thing that that actually is also of importance for us as bondholders too, which is like, where's the liquidity coming from? You know, if, if this does need to restructure, they're going to need time to do it. We want to be able to put the, put that in place. And it's a question of, is it coming from us or are the banks being supportive of the company? How, how is the company, uh, how is the liquidity uh, going to be put in place on a on a interim basis here in order to allow for the the restructuring conversations to mature. Right. Well, I'm interested because so far I've heard neither you nor Chris talk about reserve values or or asset values, and I'm looking at a balance sheet that's showing almost half a billion dollars in equity. I mean, can't you just write a check out of Treasury and get your guys paid and happy? Right. Well, it, you know, one thing I think most investors are extremely familiar with here is the fact that book value is very different than real value for these E&P companies. Uh, you know, book value is, you know, SEC um, accounting. Uh, it has look back. It's not forward looking. And so, you know, the, the, those are rapidly, uh, those things can, can change pretty significantly. One thing that you did say, John, that I just wanted to mention, though, is that, you know, where where things um, and look, trading value is not a representative of, of, of true value, but it, at least it gives a marker for people to look at and say, OK, the market thinks that this company is worth X amount of dollars and where those bonds trade will actually be pretty important, I think, as to the actions that Chris may want to take or, or my clients may want to take. Right. So uh, I had uh, one of our slides that unfortunately no one's able to see right now had some some indications and some factors for value uh, out of the price, certainly performance, volume, these these contracts we mentioned, maybe for regulated pipelines as well. A anything else that, that comes to mind? No, no, you've look, you've hit you've hit upon a lot of the the, the major issues. Um, it's it's you know obviously it's price and volume driven, but it's also the expenses side too, which is you know what what is the price of your midstream and transportation? How does that into eat into your profitability? What is your GNA? How does that in, eat into your profitability? Uh, and you know therefore, it, what, what's your break even cost? Because uh, that 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 helps a lot as to whether you have assets that are going to be investable. Right. So Rob, as, as, as usual, the unsecured creditors are thought of as the last in line. And so you're our last speaker on the panel. Uh, can't imagine that your folks are, are overly happy with this or. Am, am I going to be representing the creditors committee when this company goes in? 
Yeah, why don't uh, you I'm assume that? I'm against Chris, and I got to get to posing, and I'm deposing Mike. I already uh, got all cross examination waiting to go. I, I, I hadn't seen the notice, counsel, but uh, let's proceed informally. Okay, as long as my product beach face signed off, I'm good to go. <laughs> uh, give me, give me my question. Yeah, so uh, you're sitting there with uh, 45 million dollars of trade debt, at least on the balance sheet. I guess my first question is. Do you really think that that's the full extent of your trade debt, or are there hidden items that might come home to roost and ultimately well, become part of your constituency? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, if if Mike and Chris get together and say critical vendor out everybody, there's nothing for me to do. I look on for another case, right? But that forty five million is not a real number, right? Because in your footnote, you're going to be rejecting, or at least attempting to reject, assuming covenant with the land language is um, um, favorable to the debtor's position, you're going to have presumptively hundreds of millions of rejection damages claims. Right. You're also going to have mom and pop bondholders, which can be quite significant. Mike's group, I'm sure, is going to be comprised of very sophisticated, large hedge funds that will own a majority, maybe more than a majority, but presumptively not every bondholder. And they're gonna wanna cut a deal, at least if we're extrapolating from past cases, um, they're gonna wanna cut a deal that enables them to be sort of the white knight exit financiers, presumptively providing some sort of a backstop to a rights offering to fill whatever the RBA lenders are requiring to reset. And if you can't afford to pay, if you're not equipped, if you're not in the inner circle, you'll be out in the cold too, which means that portion of the unsecured bond uh, debt that's not part of the backstop group is going to be part of our constituency. So I would assume that our group will in the end be larger in terms of quantum of debt than what's listed here for the unsecured bonds. Okay. So what's the dynamic? Who approaches whom here? Chris, your, your debtor's counsel. Uh, it is, I suppose it varies by case, but are you going to try to reach out to either Michael or Robert's constituencies? Um, well, we would absolutely, um, it, it is, it does vary case by case. I mean, we would obviously be in close coordination with our RBL lenders. They're obviously, um, an important source of liquidity. Um, you know, again, to, to just to take a step back, you know, you asked about value. Everybody on this, you know, Zoom call knows there's a difference between the value and liquidity. And if we really want to be able to unlock whatever the maximum value is, we need to be able to run through an organized process. We need to be able to, you know, fund the business um, and do whatever we're going to do, whether it's an amend and extend or whether it's a full, you know, a full on chapter 11. Um, you know, if the company if the redetermination takes the borrowing base down and we have a, um, a coupon to pay and we don't have sufficient cash, you can't run the business like that, right? You can't let employees come to work and incur payroll. You can't incur taxes. You don't, you just can't do that. So um, without a sufficient source of, uh, of funding to fund what is hopefully an organized and consensual process, this company is in a fire sale liquidation. And, and I don't think anybody would, argue that that's not the right way to maximize the value of, of all the assets. So close coordination with RBO lenders, um, obviously um, discussions with the bondholders, um, important, um, absolutely would happen. Um, it, you know, in this case, given sort of what we've just outlined about, um, about Rob and his position, probably unlikely. Um, I don't, you know, unless, unless Rob, formally was representing, I don't know, some can, you know, some committee of, of potential trade creditors or some minority bondholders. Um, I, I think you're in a little bit of triage mode here and you're trying to do the best you can to keep the lights on for a while. Um, it would be, you know, not in my experience to, to think that there's going to be um, a sort of a committee of trade creditors that's going to get together and, and fund the business. Not impossible, of course, but that's that's certainly not typical. So I think it would probably be unlikely that before a formal process started, um, you know, we would we would reach out to that constituency. But you know, look that you know if people if people have a solution to offer, we would you know we would always listen. <clears throat> About do you have? Uh, 
do you meet with management to find out if certain vendors are absolutely crucial to their business? Yeah, that's that's an important um, an important part of this. I, I, I agree with Rob, by the way, on the question you asked him about whether 45 is likely to be the number. Um, I mean, we footnoted the midstream contracts. Um, there are likely to be Mike, Mike's group is unlikely to be 100 percent of the bonds sometimes, but but not always the case. And so there'll be um, unsecured bondholders who are not within the ad hoc group. Um, and in cases like this, it's important to understand the various um, buckets of trade creditors, let's call it, um, you know, in, in oil and gas cases and EMP cases, there are a host of trade creditors that end up actually not being in the trade creditor bucket because they work on the, they work on the wells, they work on the pads, they're lean creditors. And those are actually creditors who may in fact even be senior to uh, permitted prior liens, maybe senior to the RBL lenders. And so that some of that trade is likely to come down, other trade is likely to, you know, to arise. Um, and so, um, you know, so that number, that number is likely to change. Right. And you, you mentioned the liens. Uh, so is it the case that in oil producing states, generally by statute, vendors who furnish goods or services uh, to a well bore or to a lease are secured by a lien? Yes, I, that's a very general statement. But yes, there are a lot of statutory liens available for um, trade creditors, material men, um, you know, folks who work on the actual sites, on the well sites, um, available in, um, in, in all these, um, you know, in all these states where we're drilling and production is, um, is significant, Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, um, in all these states that we've, we've done cases in. <clears throat> so we haven't really focused on the white elephant in the room, which is that you've got a negative cash flow, Chris, uh, and, and, and at best six months of run rate, uh, in the bank, uh, Where's the money coming from? Um, it's likely to come from the RBL lenders, um, unless there's some uh, bridge type facility that uh, another constituent that Mike constitu Mike's constituency wants to put in place. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm I'm a big fan of filing at a time when the company has prepared as much as possible. So it, it's unlikely that, that I, I shouldn't say that. I guess if it's not to be the case where, for example, Mike's group is in, puts in a second lien that keeps the company out for a while, I guess that's possible. If, if everybody, you know, arrives at the conclusion that this is, this is going to be a restructuring, this is going to be a chapter 11 and there's to be more, um, uh, you know, prep that goes into the process before we file, then it's, it's probably a shorter, um, you know, bridge facility, either from, you know, the RBL lenders, perhaps, um, or, or from Mike's constituency, um, just to bridge, allow us to prep a little bit and see how buttoned up and, and how consensual we can make at least the first part of the case before the company files, right? A, a, you know, a free fall chapter 11 is, you know, is, um, the worst we can do for a company. So we, we kind of, we would always try to do a little bit better than that and make it a little bit more stable going in. Sure. Always. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the Jeffrey slides that was very interesting to me, and I think it, it confirms what we've been seeing in practice is that the U S banks have, uh, we know that the private equity, we know that the public equity markets have been closed to, to oil deals. Uh, but I was Michael, I was shocked to see that, uh, Bank of America, for example, has completely liquidated its uh, EMP portfolio. All right. So I, I think, you know, Chris Michael might be in a situation where if he has traditional bank lenders, which is not always the case now in the RBL first lien facility, but if he does, they may say, you know, we don't want any more of this deal. We kind of like to be paid and, and not offer uh, a, a dip line of credit. Where are your folks in that equation? Yeah, then it falls back on us uh, to pick up the slack. And that, that can, you haven't seen that happen too much yet, John. Uh, I think what we're doing is flagging like, hey, this might be coming next. 
You're, you're absolutely right. You know, you're, you're seeing a lot of RBL lenders and even very supportive RBL lenders starting to leave the market. Uh, you're starting to see when there's maturities that, you know, some of the regional banks or foreign banks aren't really signing up in order to roll. Uh, you haven't seen yet what you're outlining here with Chris, which is that banks just, you know, hitting a default and saying, I'm not going to help. I think most banks realize that trying to, you know, and we've seen this in several cases, trying to force asset sales in this particular moment in time isn't necessarily the best decision as far as covering collateral. Um, we, you know, we worked, uh, and actually I was alongside k and in this case and Samson Resources, where we had that back in 2016. I think we were able to craft a plan there that ultimately allowed for an orderly liquidation to occur in a way that you know benefited all creditors. But it's pretty rare. If you're going to be selling, it's at a fire sale price. It's going to be for cash bidders. Those bidders are going to be at a pretty high discount rate to PDP value right now. They're, you're not going to get credit for any undeveloped or hardly any, maybe some duck value, but that's about it. And so I, I think most constituents realize that to maximize value, that's not a path to go. What you have seen in a few instances where the banks themselves are quite concerned about what the collateral coverage is, is you, you see dual processes where you have, you know, if it's unclear that the unsecured creditors are really going to support a pay down that's adequately necessary in order to make the banks have a, uh, you know, performing loan, um, you see sometimes these dual processes but at least in my seat on this hypothetical, I'm going to my guys and saying, do we have money? And if so, you know, we're going to put up the dip ourselves and control the case and be able to manage it from there. Right. So you, you hit on something that I know is one of uh, Rob's favorite topics. Um, when you talk about the RBL lenders uh, and you look at the balance sheet number attributed to oil and gas reserves in this market, does that real world valuation vary from uh, a gap valuation in terms of practice. Rob, uh, for example, what are you seeing in companies that were essentially set up as, as exploratory companies, the Chesapeake type companies of, of the world in terms of how, how the market is valuing their, their acreage that they've acquired, but not yet drilled. I think, I think what you're getting at is the PUD value. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so you, you can and what, let's explain our terms because we're not all oil folks. So you have, uh, we'll use Chesapeake as, as a guidepost. You have uh, millions of acres of undeveloped acreage where um, it's proven there's an ocean of oil and gas underneath. And if you had the capital to set up your rigs, you would have hydrocarbons. Problem is it's too expensive and the commodity pricing right now isn't, isn't such that it's a good investment to go ahead and do that drilling. So you just have this acquisition that sits on the balance sheet. You know, again, Mike mentioned gap, it's carrying costs, purchase price, you know, over, you know, extrapolating depreciation over time. There's no transaction that requires any fresh start accounting on that. So you end up just carrying this big acquisition value uh, on, on the books, but um, you know, one of the major issues that we see is in the migration of gap and non-bankruptcy valuation work, investment valuation work, for example, is the new standards of value that come into play when you're actually in a bankruptcy case. And it's largely reorganization value or fair market value. And, and that's where the twain don't meet, right? Because PUD value may be enormous in terms of acreage, in terms of balance sheet, but if no one's lending against it, if it's not producing today hydrocarbons, it's an inchoate asset class. We'd be better off doing sort of Monte Carlo and option pricing value, but, but even that's controversial because normal bankruptcy metrics don't normally ascribe value to non cash flow operative assets that you can't sell in the market today. So we find ourselves in this situation a lot. That, that's where the value comes in a lot of these cases. And, and ironically, in certain situations, this, uh, this leased but undeveloped acreage can actually be a drag. I mean, it just doesn't sit on your balance sheet to a large extent. Uh, if the if the landowners were smart, uh, they have turned it into a perishable commodity. Because Chris, how how often are you running into drilling commitments that your clients are facing 
for their approved undeveloped assets. Yeah, that, I mean, obviously that uh, that's always a consideration. Um, I, I think most of the management teams that I've worked with are factoring that into the drill plan go forward. Um, that they're um, you know in order pr- to preserve those perishable assets. Um, you know, they're thinking about what needs to be drilled and when, and obviously the economics of drilling um, those areas is, is another important factor, but um, you know, that's all part of what the drill plan is going to be, what the business plan is going to be. And that, you know, that's sort of the, you know, the foundation for, uh, for evaluation. So um, yeah, those are, those are important concerns and they're, they're always, um, they're always on our mind management's mind. So let's, let's stick with uh, valuation for a second. You've got, we think we've solved your liquidity problem because you think that the RBL lenders might be willing to make a, a defensive dip, as they're called. And you have Michael's uh, constituency as a potential uh, backstop lender. Uh, what if the lenders are skittish about the asset values and want to say, well, how would we fare? We don't really care about O'Hara's group. They're, they're bondholders and they're, you know, we're the RBL lenders, they're below us. What we care about is us getting paid. How quick can you sell this stuff and what's it worth? What do you, what do, you do there and what's your experience been? Um, that was for me. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, my experience there has been um, actually that where O'Hara's group is willing to step up. The lenders aren't taking positions like that. We've, um, it's not always the case, um, but in my experience, RBL lenders, they, they do want to reduce their exposure. Um, some of them want out entirely. Some of them are willing to continue to, to lend to a reorganized business with a significantly delevered capital structure. But where you have a group of sophisticated institutions that's willing to effectively put their money where their mouths are um, and and step up with, uh, you know, a backstop in the form of whatever it is, an equity rights offering so that, you know, down the road, um, there can be some pay down and an adjustment to the size of the RBL in a, in a reorganized structure. They're not really RBL lenders aren't, you know, pushing companies to, um, just fire sale to liquidate on an expedited basis. It certainly happens sometimes. We, I mean, we see, we see it happen, but um, it, that's not that's not always the case. I think I think Mike's group has um, a significant amount of of control. Maybe that's not the right word, but input into the process because you know if they're willing to, as I said, put their money where their mouths are, then. Our, our BL lenders are willing to listen and they're willing to go through a process that they, that they, where they see, you know, an appropriate outcome on the other side. Right. So Michael, just as uh, uh, the RBL lenders may not care so much about your group, uh, you, you probably don't care that much about your constituents probably don't care that much about Rob's group. And if you're sitting there as the, as the, uh, the bond holders, maybe you're in a second lien position, or, or maybe you're totally unsecured. Uh, how do you, how do you think about your value proposition? Yeah, no, it's a good question, John. Uh, what I would say is that the restructurings that we're seeing right now, the new money it dictates the terms with which how it's going to play out. There, there's obviously you know some sort of agreement ultimately made, and this is where Robert's going to come in, on what is the right value uh, and what are the right terms of how that new money comes in. As you know, there's been um, many deals over the last several years that have fairly fairly rich uh, uh, fees associated with it, as well as a you know discount to to plan plan value, plan equity value, and there's you know a determination of what we think the value proposition is. Then there's a determination as to what the new money and how that new money is coming in, and and then there's a, a discussion with the company and the banks as to okay is that the appropriate level of new money that ultimately delevers the company to a position 
that we can get exit financing from the existing RBL lenders, as well as provide adequate liquidity so that there's no you know, further need for any, any other restructuring. And once we've kind of determined that, then we have to decide, you know, our group has to decide, hey, okay, you know, we're good for it. We're good for that money. And here's the terms that we're prepared to do it. And what you've also typically seen is that that new money is going to, you know, get the lion's share of the economics within deals. Um, because that, that new money check is very expensive right now. It, you know, it's hard, particularly, you know, in, a, in, in this commodity environment and the volatility involved to get parties to commit to equity financing is very challenging. So I think you've just touched on two of uh, Rob's hot buttons. Uh, do, but Michael, before we leave you, uh, does your group care mostly about projected cash flow or, or are you looking at inherent asset value? Uh, both. I, I, I would say that investors know that for there to be a uh, oil and gas company that ultimately is going to be attractive to regular way investors in this environment right now, that it has to be, uh, it has to be living within its means, meaning cash flow positive, and, and it has to have real asset underlying asset value, meaning either either you know, either current assets that have long lives. As you know, in oil and gas, you're 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 basically monetizing your value every day. So you know, is this are these assets long life assets? You know, slow decline, long life assets, or it has to have inventory available that allows uh, with a reasonable amount of capital for you to replenish that value over time. So the, the, that's what investors are looking for. You know, they, they want to know that they're, they're, they're not investing into a black hole and, you know, the, the quality of the assets, frankly, the quality of the management team also plays a, plays a part in it, but the quality of the assets, the cash flow availability of the assets, super important to being able to get comfortable to write that check. Okay. So we can have an entire additional hour on management teams and how they're paid and what they're paid and why, you know, whether they should be paid the way they are. Uh, but I want to get back to Rob's two hot buttons that you pushed. Rob, I heard Michael talk about uh, valuation and the expensive price of equity. Right. How does your constituent group look at those two items? Well, they don't generally get to look at those two items until after the fact, right? I mean, I, I, in order to answer your question, I have to kind of reroute a little bit. So forgive me for being me for a second, right? Sure. Look, at what, look at what's going on here, right? You're seeing it in a microcosm. RBLs are a weird financing construct. A good management team plods along, borrowing on its revolver, notwithstanding good efforts, good thought, good faith, wakes up one morning and finds itself hundreds of millions overdrawn due to circumstances beyond its control. That's, that's not, that doesn't happen in any other industry, at least none that I'm aware of, right? We do borrowing bases, we do advance rates. So you can kind of plot it out and you have the capacity to measure your liquidity, not just with Saudi Russia, geopolitical election issues that impact you adversely, and you find yourself unplanned and out of liquidity, calling up Chris Marcus and saying, oh my God, I'm in bankruptcy in 30 days, who would have thunk it, right? But that's what he's in. Chris, you know, I love him. He's in survival mode. I mean, he, he puts kind of a different gloss on it because he's such a great professional, but he's in there in survival mode, right? Mike, on the other hand, comes in with the bondholders, fully aware that Chris is in survival mode and says, I'm the only game in town. I'm the only place you're going to get liquidity. And by the way, those RBL lenders, they don't want to own this thing. They'll do it if they have to. They don't have all the patience in the world to run out of process. But if I come up with a solution that pays them down just enough that I get the equity, I'm a buyer and they're a seller. And poor Chris is sitting there stretched over a barrel and saying, okay, I guess I got to do that deal. So now you flop into bankruptcy, but it's not a flopping because you have an RSA that's wedged into a dip 
which has got three months until it expires and says, there's nothing to do here, judge. This case is over. I cut a deal with Michael Hara, who's our saving. He's our white knight who cut a deal with the RBLs who had us over a barrel and all is fine. Right. Possessions, nine tenths of the law. And the deal is possessions. They've got nine tenths. But don't worry, Stark. You'll have your day in court with your one tenth ability to challenge everything we've done. And by the way, between the time that they cut the deal, signed the RSA, wedged it into the, into the dip, they went out and they commissioned some sort of valuation report. Maybe the board got separate counsel to do a whitewash. Okay. And they go into bankruptcy and they say, deal is done. I got a great law firm. I got great bank telling us fairness opinions, legal opinions, whatever. The deal is done. You don't need to think about it anymore. We're saving jobs. We're saving the industry. <clears throat> sorry that the redetermination guys can't, you know, sorry that the uh, rejections can't get paid or the mom and pops go talk to your congressman. That's the way the law works. Right. And I sit there and I say, when did you ever think about the value as you were cutting your smoky backroom deal? When did you think about whether or not when Mike was saying, I'll give you the 100, the 200 million that you need, but I take all? Is that too much? I, I, I take it at a given that it's not an easy job when your RBL is in redetermination and you're overdrawn by your working capital. And that's not, that's, there's nothing, it's not an easy job Chris has in those scenarios, okay? And I, and I recognize the fact that RBL lenders, the, the traditional bank RBL lenders, don't want to be in the ownership business. They're not private equity sponsors. They'll do it if they have to, but they don't want to. And, when, and that just means the company's going into runoff. So that's not protective to the enterprise either, right? Mike is offering a solution and his client should be paid handily for it, including at equity cost of capital levels. But they sometimes overreach, and that's where the creditors committee comes in and says, maybe that's not fair. Maybe that's a little too much. And maybe the job that you did backfilling with your, enter your commission enterprise valuation or your legal opinions at the board level isn't really fair and appropriate. And that's where the valuation lines get drawn, I think. So you also mentioned that uh, there could be value in the PUDs. And, and you and I offline have previously right. talked about different ways that people who are out of the money uh, might have some sort of, uh, forgive the phrase, a hope certificate uh, on a go forward basis for assets that are given very little value. You want to chat about that for a moment? Well, I do, but I want to correct your out of the money characterization because the only people that are telling you that they're out of the money is Chris and Mike from the Smoky Backroom Dealmaking, right? There is well, but, no market but, to But they have an appraisal. Them. What's that? But they have an appraisal. And they I mean, probably they've got no Harris opinion. Not worth the paper it's written on, but it costs an awful lot. And Mike likes to say, well, but there's market pricing of bonds. I'm a behavioralist. I don't believe that in distressed arbitrage when there's no information, the smoky back deal, uh, back deals going on that you really ever do get to an efficient market hypothesis. And that doesn't help either. Let's get to the true value of this thing. And there are two components. I mean, there's the one that you mentioned. And then there's the other, which is, the forward curve on the commodity pricing, which everyone loves to talk about. We got this ocean of, of hydrocarbons and we're gonna sell it over time and management can't project what the, what the pricing would be. So we go to nine extra pricing, right? One year, two year, five year, 10 year, okay? And is that reliable? And then there is all of this acreage that, is in, that, is to, that they tell us is worth zero. But if you walked into the headquarters of Chesapeake, if you walked into the headquarters of any larger EMP and said, I will buy from you what you say is worth zero, I'll give you 10 million bucks for it. They won't give it to you. Mike won't let them part with the acreage, right? Because well, that's, part of, that's part of his investment thesis. We're going to bridge to another time, another place, and we very well may drill then, but it's still zero today for all intents and purposes. The deal relies upon that zero, and you can't say differently, but if you offer them real cash for it, they won't sell. So how does your group access some value for, for your, how do you access some value for your constituents? Well, there's, you know, look, I, I, I there are valuation trials. There, there haven't been plentiful in oil and gas land for a variety of different reasons, but we've had a few. 
Um, and, uh, and that's not only in Houston, but in New York, at right um, uh, the, the, and So that's an area of continuing evolution and it will continue to evolve, especially as the case, cases get bigger and the issues get more complicated, right? You, you have attributes of that trial that I, I don't believe has been fully, from our jurisprudential perspective, truly vetted out. We're supposed to normalize our, thre- our way through peaks and valleys in an industry uh, scenario, I don't know where we are in the peaks and values, but I don't see any normalizing going on in the way that people do valuations today, right? And everybody's all about market, 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 market. And yet, if you do the evaluate, if you have, there's a lot of academic research that's come out in the last six months about the fact that the NYMEX is always dour and, and rarely predicts accurately, and there's no transacting beyond two years anyway. So there is no efficient market hypothesis. So we're making it up. Right. These cases are being made up. And that's where the valuation jurisprudence, I think, will mature in the days ahead. Hopefully, I can create enough concern on not on Chris's part, because he just wants a deal. And I and I and I applaud him for it. he's doing his job well. But on the part on Mike's part, or his client's part to sit down and talk about these things and come up with a solution that actually is a little more productive. So do you ask for some sort of uh, future interest in uh, you know, maybe some sort of overriding royalty after payout to. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love that. I mean, it's a wonderful attribute in the EMP sector that I think is underutilized to solve these kinds of problems. You know, for in Delaware, New York, other widget jurisdictions, it's really more about warrants. But these companies don't want to exit in a public way; they want to exit in a private way. Right. And so warrants become very difficult as a means to kind of, you can still do it, right? But it's not a particularly easy security to kind of figure out what to do with, you know, post-closing. I think overrides are really interesting, but I can't yet get anybody interested in talking to me about those right. maybe in the days ahead. Uh, okay. Well, well, we'll save that for another another day. Let's, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left. Let's, let's talk about, can you see this slide that says, how can investors profit? Great. So, Michael, this is probably more your bailiwick. Um, how, how do so you have an investor coming into a bad situation or an investor who's already in a bad situation? And I just jotted down some stray thoughts about how they might be able to uh, rationalize, right size the company, uh, you know, do take some steps or have management take some steps. That might help the company, might help the investors, might help the lenders. What uh, what do you look at when, if if for example, you get called not by the bondholders but by but by Chris, and he says, "Got a tough case here. I want you to look at this and help me figure this out. We've got some time." Yeah, well, I I think that last statement is the key statement. If you have time, then you can start to think about what are the different alternatives that this company has in order to buy more time. Because, you know, as we've seen in just the last five years, let alone, you know, 30 years, the price of oil and gas goes up and down. And there's times to uh, monetize and there's times to buy and you know it just depends upon the circumstances that you find yourself in but generally speaking if you can extend out you know the quote unquote option value uh, that's a good thing so you know we we work with uh, Chris and his team to understand the the company's debt documents and what is available that can be done so you've seen in many instances that companies have been successful and being able to do liability management exercises that have um, either you know, up-tiered certain debt into a secured capacity, uh, usually done at a favorable discount that actually saves the company some money as well as lowers its debt burden. You've seen instances where companies have been able to drop certain assets and do exchanges or raise financing uh, in, in that type of a situation. Uh, You've seen instances where the existing creditors themselves go to the company and say, hey, we're willing, you know, we like what you're doing. We understand it's a tough time. We're we're willing to do X, Y, and Z. We've seen overrides, as as Robert just pointed out, 
where you know we sold overrides uh, to you know it's a, it's a different in, in many respects it's changed recently but you know overrides traditionally were a different uh, constituent group or of investors usually uh, more infrastructure oriented and therefore had lower cost of capital and very attractive valuations to uh, to companies so th- there's ways uh, for companies to to uh, you know, monetize some of their assets in a way or finance some of their assets in a way that ultimately does uh, what, what what is the most important thing at that moment, which is buy more time. Right. Chris, anything to add to that? Um, no, not really. I, 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 you know, to go back to, to what Rob said, um, you know, he's, He's complimentary and very eloquent. I, I think the one, well, I would say I would dispute the smoky back room uh, comment, but a lot of what he said is in fact true. Um, you know, the, uh, the development, the, the time you have to develop alternatives gives you the ability to frankly get to a place where you know there's going to be more consensus, where it's where it's more fair. If you don't have any, if you don't have any time and you're just kind of rushing into a process and, you know, you have no liquidity left and the RBL lenders are only willing to, you know, participate in the process if Mike's group is willing to backstop it and he says he is and these are the terms, then yeah, there's a significant leverage um significant amount of leverage um, on his side. I mean, I'm all about developing alternatives and having, um, you know, as much optionality as possible, because that's what keeps people, uh, that's what keeps, that's what keeps people rational, frankly. Um, I think, you know, one thing that Rob said, which is let's, he said, you know, let's, let's get to the real value, um, you know, but I, I think that statement coupled with everything else, a little bit takes for granted that somebody is actually stepping up and willing to finance a process that's letting you get to as close as you can to maximize value. And there are obviously economic, look, Mike's clients are, they're economic actors and they're going to want as much as they, as much as they can get. Um, and, and Rob's clients are, are their creditors too. And they're going to want as much as they can get. And that's totally fair. Um, but you know, from from my perspective, when I'm sitting in the you know in the debtors' council seat, um, I, I'm not just thinking about Mike's clients and Rob's you know clients in the future. But we have a lot of employees, and we have a lot of vendors, and we have a lot of um, you know other constituents that are really important. And so, if if the only two options I have are an RSA that has you know terms that I know that Rob is not going to be all that happy with, versus just you know, we could just liquidate the company now. It's not often that difficult as a decision for a board, to be honest with you. So, you know, I, again, I don't, I don't think that, you know, smoky back room is the right way to say it. I think, you know, negotiating with creditors who have a significant amount of leverage because they're willing to, frankly, step up and fund a process to allow value to be maximized at least as much as possible under the circumstance. You know, that's a really important consideration as part of this. So, you know, as to the, you know, these, these, um, you know, alternatives and developing um, alternatives that will extend your timeline, you know, those are, um, those are always important. As long as you, you know, if you have more time and you could come up with more options, um, you know, it, it, the deal becomes um, more rational. One of, our, uh, one of our audience members is channeling uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller and uh, at least as expressed through Daniel Day-Lewis based on his movie clip. And his question is, how, do, uh, how much do long-term strategic plays, and this is where he puts in his Daniel Day-Lewis quote, factor into valuations when there are external, potentially random or, to Rob's point, behavioral factors affecting possible outcomes. So how do the long-term value players react to these market forces? Do they ignore them? Do they factor them in? Do they discount for them? Yeah, look, I, I, I think, uh, I think, well, the last few years, what, what more 
do we need, you know, aside from aliens coming down from Earth, I think we've already hit pretty much everything we can, right? I mean, we've had wars, we've had uh, oil wars between countries, we've had a pandemic, we've had, uh, you know, we've had a rush of new supply, we've had demand issues. I, I mean, it, it, everything you could possibly think of has kind of happened recently. And yeah, of course, investors focus on that. I, you know, part of part of the challenge that the oil industry has right now is what is its longer term business plan look like? You know, for 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 the U.S. companies, what are their longer term plan? And you know, we we actually I believe um, put some slides in here. You know, what we're hearing from the market is that you need to, as we talked about earlier, you need to be cash flow positive, right? You need to, frankly, what you ultimately are going to need to is you're going to need to be able to have a, a consistent dividend or, or, or an ability to, to, to pay investors back. Um, you, you need to therefore be at a leverage level that protects to the downside so that if oil ever goes back to 25, let alone negative, that you have resiliency in order to, to be able to ride that out. You have to have assets that, again, are either long life or have inventory that allows to replenish in a way that, again, makes that dividend consistent. You know, these are the things that, are, that need to happen. And part of the reason I'm emphasizing those is that you know, part of what's gotten all these companies in trouble is, uh, is an issue that you raised earlier, Robert raised earlier, which is that they bought all of this inventory at prices that were very expensive at that point in time because the model was different. The economic model was different. The investor model was different. And it didn't factor in a lot of the issues that have occurred over the last five years, these, these external um, you know, macro oil issues that have you know, shocked the market on several occasions now. So I, I think what you're going to see, and you have on this side, consolidation. I think eventually you are going to see consolidation. We, we've been kind of wondering when it's going to happen. There's been some inklings of it recently in a few deals that have occurred where they've gotten away from the relative value issues that have plagued the ability to do consolidation because they recognize that the next bullet you have, rationalization of overhead, is an important co component to ultimately getting to a size organization that allows for the proper amount of GNA, you know, because it's not like you can, you can make it go to zero. So you have to have the proper amount of GNA to actually run these organizations. So you need the right size in order to do that. And you need the right asset mix and everything else in order to get to investors to be interested in, you know, buying into your company on a longer term basis. I, we're, we're very close to out of time, but a, a distressed investor once told me that uh, on the development side, and nobody's really drilling these days. But if but if he could get into a, a field, maybe in the Permian, where he had very low, very good reserves, very low drilling cost, and his cost to drill was you know thirty, he would do that all day and could sell it at forty or even thirty five. He'd do that all day long. But you don't yeah, see much of that. No, look, the, the Permian is one of the unique assets, you know, the Permian and Appalachia are kind of two unique assets in, in oil and gas in the sense of that the, the cost of getting the hydrocarbons out of the ground is still very rational at the current rates. Right. Uh, it's, it's the marginal plays around it that I, I think are become a, a little bit more challenging. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to thank the panelists. I see that my big brother, Harold, has come on to tell me I'm out of time. And uh, I'd like to thank each of you. Uh, for the audience, the slides will be made available. And Harold, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Well, well thank, yeah. thanks, thanks a John. lot, John and group. Hello. Thanks. Thanks a lot um, for that panel. Um, I, I want to thank Gary Blitz of Aeon Nolly for the sessions he he's, he uh, he did, but also for giving me the opportunity to do the closing today to thank the last panel who are composed of longtime friends and colleagues who I arm twisted a little bit to do this conference because you see them and their firms in so many of the lion's share of the major oil and gas cases nowadays. Um, anyway, thank you again. Uh, today, this is the closing of today's session, but we have another session tomorrow, and I couldn't be more excited about most 
if not all the sessions. In particular, tomorrow we start with, and please don't miss this, at 11 o'clock Eastern, we start with Jamie Spray Reagan giving his remarks from the mountain. Uh, as you all know, Jamie's really one of the tremendous leaders, and I can't wait to hear what he has to say about where he thinks where we're going. Uh, that's followed by the investors panel roundtable, which might be particularly interesting this uh, uh, this year, uh, followed by the underwriters and covenants and pandemic, a session on distressed hospital sales, and then the annual recognition awards for turnaround and workouts, outstanding young bankruptcy lawyers. So at any rate, that ends today's session. I'd like to thank all the panelists and thank everyone who are in attendance. And I wish everyone a good rest of the day and see you sharp 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern time tomorrow.